So, Divinity Unveiled, part five. And I've called this a little bit of history. Um, we're basically going to have a look at a very brief, condensed version of what happened from, say, the time of the Apostles forwards to about the end of the fourth century, when the doctrine of the Trinity was ratified. And we're just going to show some simple, you know, how things occurred in the history. Um, one thing I really struggled with this is trying to condense all that information into a, an hour odd, you know. Um, those of you who have looked at the writings of the Church Fathers will know that they're very numerous and very lengthy and, you know, it can, it can be quite hard to condense all that information down. So hopefully, I've tried to keep it kind of simple today. So, today we'll trace the evolution of doctrine in regards to divinity. We'll see how things changed and where things went a bit awry. This will be by no means exhaustive. Um, you can, I could have quite easily done a two-part teaching on just one person's theology. And we're kind of covering four. You know, so I've tried to really condense it. Um, it will be like a reader's digest of the events from the first century through to the fourth century. You know, so by no means exhaustive. What today will be is about knowing where the various doctrines regarding divinity originated and why. You'll have to edit that. <laughs> Knowing these things can actually uh, help us peel back the layers of man-made tradition and doctrine. So kind of like, you know, peeling away the layers of the onion to get to the middle. Um, so yeah, let's have a look. Before we do that, I want to kind of lay a foundation. Many think that anything with the label Christian or Jewish or Messianic or Torah originated with Yeshua and his followers. The, the, the modern one now we have in, in our sort of sphere is anything with the name Torah next to it must be truth. And people just gladly and glibly swallow it down. Most will agree, though, especially in this room, that this is not the case, even with just the cursory and honest glance at what Scripture has to say. There's a lot of stuff out there right now in the name of Torah, so to speak, that is frankly utter rubbish. What most fail to see is that even by the end of the first century, false teachers and doctrines had already begun to infiltrate the assembly by the end of the first century. So not long, you know, you know Paul is estimated to have been martyred at around 65, between 65 AD, around that area, and already Paul is warning. Our Messiah and his followers gave us many warnings in regards to this. Let's look at some of these. Yeshua said, answering, said to them, take heed that no one leads you astray. He's talking about end times here. And, you know, the disciples have asked him, what are the signs of your coming? And the first thing he says, take heed that no one leads you astray. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they shall lead many astray. They're coming in the name. And what name was Yeshua going by those days? It wasn't Jesus. He was going by his name, Yeshua. Many false prophets shall rise up and lead many astray. In Acts, this is Paul speaking. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the set-apart spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the assembly of Elohim, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves shall, coming among you, not spare in the flock. He's not saying it will happen. Also from among yourselves, not from Babylon, not from Rome, from amongst you, men shall arise speaking distorted teachings to draw away the taught ones after themselves. So he's not even saying they're going to teach outright lies. They're just going to, you know, knock it off course a bit. And over a long period of time, you end up way off the path. Therefore watch, remembering that for three years, night and day, I did not cease to warn each one with tears. He, he warned us. In 2 Corinthians 13, for such are false emissaries, deceptive workers, masquerading as emissaries of Messiah. 
Not as messengers of Allah or Buddha, messengers of Messiah. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as a messenger of light. It is not surprising then that if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works, they will seem righteous. They will look all good on the coating, right? Peter says this, but there also came to be false prophets among the people, also among you. There shall be false teachers. Again, the, the warnings are coming from inside. Who shall secretly bring in destructive heresies. You won't even notice it happening. Call it, the, you know we get the analogy of the frog in the pan being heated very slowly. And we'll see that this is what happened over centuries. And deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Now, I don't think they were, that these people were sitting there going, right, what am I going to bring into the church today? You know, it's, did Peter know he was being used as in an adversarial position when Yeshua says, get behind me, Satan? No, he wasn't aware of this. And many shall follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And in greed with fabricated words they shall use you for gain. From of old their judgment does not linger, and their destruction does not slumber. First John. Little children, it is the last hour. As you have heard from the anti as you have heard that the anti Messiah is coming, even now. Many, many anti-Messiahs have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now, in John's day, you had all sorts going on. You had Greek ph ph uh, philosophers, you had Stoics, you had the Platonists, you had all sorts. You had um, Gnosticism rising. And actually, Gnosticism was, looked like Christianity on the outside to some degree. They went out from us. They didn't come from outside. They came from us. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have stayed with us. We lose sight. These false teachers came from the body. But in order that it might be manifest that none of them were of us. He's not warning them of the people outside. He's saying, watch. Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of Elohim, every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is of Elohim. And every spirit that does not confess that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah which you heard is coming and now already in the world. Again, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. This is, we've covered this, but people that say that Messiah was not pre-existent is what this is tackling. There's nothing, uh, we said this in a previous part, there's nothing special about us coming in the flesh. But Messiah, now that's something altogether different. Denial that the word came in the flesh is a grave error. Now, 3 John, I've mentioned this before in passing, I wrote to the assembly, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not receive us. So if I come, I shall call to mind his works, which he does, babbling against us wicked words. And not satisfied with that, he himself does not receive the brothers and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the assembly. By the mid to late first century, even the apostles themselves were being excommunicated. They would not receive John, the one that Yeshua loved, right? We, we, we forget that. We've got a person in the leadership, i.e. probably the head leader of that congregation saying, nope, and anyone that wants to follow the Apostle John, off you go with him. End of the first century. This means that true believers were actually becoming a minority, at the end of the first century. If they weren't becoming a minority, they were being pushed underground. This means they were actually being persecuted by their own, on top of the Romans, on top of the Jewish people. Now by your own people. This should bring to mind what Yeshua said, you know, that they will think they're doing Elohim's work when they cast you out of congregations. 
This is, so let's look at some of the quotes of these so-called leaders, these church fathers. Be not seduced by strange doctrines, nor by antiquated fables which are profitless. For even unto this day we live, if we live after the manner of Judaism, we avow that we have not received grace. Uh, this is talking of walking in Torah, by the way. We'll, get, we'll cover this a bit more down the teaching. If then those who had walked in the ancient practices attained unto newness of hope, no longer observing the Sabbaths, but the Sabbaths plural. So this is an attack against the Moedim. But fashioning their lives after the Lord's Day. What day is that to them? Sunday. The day that Yeshua rose, right? On which our life also rose through him. How shall we be able to live apart from him? This is Ignatius of Antioch. And this is when he lived, 35 AD to 108 AD. This is his letter to the Magnesians, the church there. He was already attacking the Shabbat and the Moedim at the end of the first century. This was a leader of the church of Antioch, by the way. This is another person. For we too would observe the fleshly circumcision and the Sabbaths and ensure all the feasts if we did not know for what reason they were enjoined to you, namely on account of your transgressions and the hardness of the hearts. He's talking to a Jewish person here. For if we patiently endure all things contrived against us by wicked men and demons so that even admit cruelties unutterable, death and torments, we pray for mercy to those who inflict such things upon us and do not wish to give the least retort to anyone, even as the new lawgiver, the new lawgiver, right, commanded us, how is it, Trifo, that we would not observe those rites which do not harm us? I speak of fleshly circumcision and the Sabbaths and the feasts. Now, this is just in Marta, and he lived 100 AD to 165 AD, and this is his dialogue against Trifo, a Jew. He says that the Sabbath, the circumcision, and the feasts were given to them because of the hardness of their hearts and their sins. Does this sound familiar? This is, look, this is at the beginning of the second century. This guy is hailed as one of the big church fathers. We'll cover a bit more on him later. Anything to do with Torah, it was thrown out the window. Why? Because it was Judaizing. They literally say these things in their writings. By the, anyway, these are the people that actually form the doctrines to do with the Godhead. He was also a Samaritan, yes. And we'll cover this, we will cover a bit more on him later. He was a Greek philosopher originally. This was the beginning of a downward spiral and departure from the word of Elohim. There were the sort of, these were the sort of doctrines that were beginning to be preached from those in charge of the assembly. So if you kept the feast or you wanted to keep Shabbat, out you go. Out you go. Along with John and all those other Judaizers, right? The false brethren and false teachers that the assembly were so vehemently warned about had well and truly begun to take hold of the assembly. It is in this context that discussions regarding the nature of divinity and the Godhead were made, as we will see. The true believers were largely absent from the scene as they had been driven underground by persecution from Jews, Romans, and even their own. There were bitter rivalries going on. Therefore, we must remember that a lot of the debates, especially from the 2nd to the 5th centuries, are not between error and truth, but between error and a different error, if that makes sense. They just happen to be in charge. Let's have a quick look at the report cards of the seven churches in Revelation. So this is now Yeshua speaking to the, the congregations. So this is where they were, the seven right here. Seven churches, modern day Turkey. This is who's being spoken to. Now, Revelation is thought to be written about 90 AD, at the end of the first century. To the messenger of the assembly of Ephesus writes, But I hold this against you, that you have left your first love. So remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I shall come speedily and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. They've fallen from their first love. 
and to the messenger of the assembly of Pergamos, write, but I hold a few matters against you because you have there those who adhere to the teaching of Bilam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat food offered to idols and to commit whoring. End of the first century. So you also have those who adhere to the teachings of the Nicolites or the Nicolaitans, which teaching I hate. Now there's various um, ideas of what that is, but a lot of them revolve around uh, sensuality and hedonism and also lauding it like, you know, the absolute authority of the clergy. Repent or else I shall come to you speedily and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I mean, sexual immorality is one of these things that gets you barred from the kingdom, right? It's already the end of the first century. And to the messenger of the assembly of Thyatira, right? But I hold this against you, that you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and lead my servants astray, to commit whoring and to eat food offered to idols. So now we have um, idolatry going on. And I gave her time to repent of her whoring, but she did not repent. See, I am throwing her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction unless they repent of their works. And I shall slay her children with death. And now all the assemblies shall know that I am the one searching the kidneys and the hearts. And I shall give you to each of one, to, I shall give to each of one of you according to your works. Now, this phrase of searching the hearts and the kidneys, we know Yeshua is speaking. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, Yah, search the heart and try the kidneys and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Uh, this idea of trying the hearts and the kidneys was like a judging and knowing the thoughts of man, knowing what goes on deep in the inside. Render unto everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, because you, you alone, know the hearts of all the sons of men. I found that interesting. There's only one that knows the hearts of men. Yeshua claims to be that person in Revelation. Let's keep going. To the messenger of the assembly in Sardis, write, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. End of the first century. The church is dead spiritually wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die for i have not found your works complete before elohim remember then how you have received and heard and watch and repent if then you do not wake up i shall come upon you as a thief and you shall not know at all what hour i come upon you i believe this was part i mean what was going on in the first century attack of the moedim Knowledge of these Moedim, you have a rough idea of what's going on. You don't, you, you know, you don't know the day, and, but do you see what I mean? Nevertheless, you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. That means that there were some who had defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. End of the first century. And to the messenger of the assembly of Laodicea, right... I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say rich I am and I am made rich and need none at all. And you do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. You know, this idea of look at us. We've got it all going. We've got the light display. We've got the mood lighting. I advise you to buy gold from me, refined in the fire, so that you become rich, and white garments so that you become dressed, so that the shame of your nakedness might not be shown, and anoint your eyes with ointment so that you see. Sorry. <laughs> By the time John is writing this, 90 AD, five of the seven churches are already veering off the path and being warned. If you don't stop what you're doing, you're not going to get in. Five of the seven churches are already in spiritual adultery and lawlessness. Let's call it out for what it is. The sort of stuff that bars entry. This is only at the end of the first century. So, in light of all this, I mean, again, like, like, it cannot be overstated enough. We, 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 we like to think that 
the, the churches of the apostles were like all great and wonderful. They probably were at first, but very, very quickly. They were going here, there, and everywhere. So far, let's establish a few things that we have covered so far in the series. The Hebrews were monotheistic. They believed that Elohim would manifest himself through his word. The word, the messenger of Yah and the Shekhinah were all synonymous with one another. The aforementioned manifestations were equated with being in his presence, not someone else's. Any departure from the monotheistic belief would have been considered blasphemy and idolatry. Because of these verses, you have no other mighty ones against my face. Hear, O Yisrael, Yah Elohim is, Yah is one, and you shall love Yah your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. They would recite this, and still do, three times a day. I am Yah, that is my name, and my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. I am Yah, and besides me there is no saviour. This was actually the defining characteristic of the Hebrew faith. Every other religion had a pantheon of gods. This was the one thing that set Yisrael apart. This fact is even attested to by pagan sources. There's a book written by Julian the Apostate, Emperor of Rome, between 361 and 363 AD, called Against the Galileans. Christians is another, that's how he called them. Now, he's called Julian the Apostate because he grew up in a Christian Environment and then veered off and basically allowed the, uh, he he uh, legalized paganism in the Roman emperor in the Roman Empire. He criticizes Christians, whom he calls Galileans, for abandoning their original beliefs. Now remember, he was brought up as a Christian, and he started to see all the hypocrisy. These include departing from monotheism. This the, he, he, one of his charges is like, oh well, you worship three gods. Departing from the dietary laws, he says, these are like you're departing from what was given to you. Departing from circumcision. Departing from the Moedim. Claiming that Christ set up a new law in stark contradiction to Moshe's warning of abandoning said law. A Roman is saying this. Not even keeping Christ's teachings, as that, for example, the example he uses, they would revere the tomb and the dead, and Christ says that tombs are a site of impurity. A Roman, he was like, you guys are hypocrites. You claim to follow these teachings, and you've gone completely off your own path. Hmm. Again, there is no mighty one beside me, a righteous cell and a saviour. There is none beside me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am El and there is none else. Now, I find this interesting in light of Acts chapter 4. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Yeshua Messiah of Nazareth, whom you impaled, whom Elohim raised from the dead, by him, this one stands before you healthy. Peter had just healed a person at the temple. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. As there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name, no other name under the heaven given among men by which we, do not, which we need to be saved. Are the disciples teaching deliverance in a different name? Is my question. If they are, they've departed from the faith of Abraham. What the faith was given to them. Thus said Yah, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, saying, I am Yah, doing all, stretching out the heavens all alone, spreading out the earth with none beside me. Now in the Targum, it says that it was I am the Lord that maketh all things. I have suspended the heavens by my word. I have laid the foundations of the earth by my strength. Psalm 36 says, By the word of Yah, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the spirit of his mouth. John says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim. All came to be through him, and without him, not even one came to be that came to be. 
Was John departing from monotheism? Were the Targumists departing from monotheism? If he was, he was depart- again, he was departing from the faith of Abraham. Let's remember how the word was thought of by John. The word in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter and mind. A term used especially in the Targum as a substitute for the Lord when an anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. That was the main problem. They didn't want to anthropomorphize, put bodily things on the eternal. So they would say, well, it was his word. Elohim, infinite in nature, infinite in power, cannot fully manifest himself to a fallen world. So he manifests himself in veil or shrouded form. Any understanding of the words has to be within a monotheistic viewpoint, or it is to depart from what John would have been trying to portray. When, when the Targumists would speak of the Lord and the word of the Lord, it wasn't defying their monotheism. It was the Lord manifesting here on earth or in our sphere of existence. This is the way they understood it. There is Yah alone. There is no one else but me, right? All the verses, there is Yah alone. He manifests himself through his word and through his spirit. The, the word and the spirit were not seen as another person. And the word and the spirit... Through the word and the spirit, he created our existence. And it is the word and the spirit that operate within our sphere of existence. That was the monotheistic viewpoint. The word was always seen as Elohim manifesting himself to his creation and not as a separate person. This was the belief until the first century. I just want to get this foundation so that we can see how the writings of the church fathers, so we can see the delineation This didn't start to change until the assembly began to rapidly increase in the first century, right? The gospel went out, and loads of people are coming in, all with their own ideas, all with their baggage. With this rapid increase came strange and foreign concepts. Let us now explore how the understanding of divinity slowly changed over the centuries, right? This is why I went to lay this foundation of Paul and the disciples and Yeshua warning, saying, look, this is the faith you've been given. Be careful of those that will distort it. So this is a nice little diagram. Yeshua dies here, 30 AD. It's, you can, we can argue the day, another day. <laughs> These are the, the Roman emperors. Let's look at Ignatius. So Ignatius is here. He's one of the church fathers. Ignatius of Antioch. We had a quote from him earlier lived 35 AD to 108 AD. He was one of the first to depart from Torah. He attacked the circumcision, the feasts, and the Sabbath, and the dietary laws. Torah keepers were seen as legalists and Judaizers. He taught the infallibility of the church and the absolute authority of the clergy. This is why the Catholic Church love him. And... um, it's, if you read his writings, he actually says the believer's not allowed to do anything without the go-ahead of the bishop. He taught that Christians should keep Sunday. He did not, It's interesting, if you read his writings, he doesn't say stop doing Shabbat. He just says stop doing it like those Jews over there. That they, they, they cease to do from labor. He says what you need to do, you need to sit and meditate on the master instead of like being lazy and doing nothing. That, those are his words. And then he says, and then obviously keep the Lord's day, because this is when we were risen with him. Now here here is his view of Messiah. You'll find it's not not any different from Paul's. Um, One thing we will see is that first the signs of covenant were attacked, then everything else around that started going a bit wonky. Here's his view of Messiah. There is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and in spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life in death, both of Mary and of God, first passable, then impassable, even Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's his view summed up of Messiah. This actually concurs with what Paul says, right? Shaul. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim, did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped. 
Now, the translations of this are quite interesting. This is the ISR. Verse 6, it's really interesting. The, Jung, the Jung's literal translation says, For let this mind be in you, that is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Like, it's, it's a slight nuance. The King James concurs with this idea. So that was Ignatius. Very anti-Torah, but he, st- there was, he still believed Yeshua to be God in the flesh. We just read it. So let's go a bit further on. But by the way, when he wrote this, we're talking in this area here. It was between 110 and 117 AD, not long before he was martyred. So we're, right now, that is the beginning of the second century. Let's look at Justin Martyr. That was the second quote we had. The body of his work came in this area, so mid-second century. Justin Martyr lived 100 AD to 163 AD. He converted to Christianity in 130 AD, before which he was a disciple of Plato's teachings. He was a philosopher, Greek philosopher. He was also very heavily, he was a Stoic, Stoicism. Um, This fact is actually very evident in his writings in that he draws from Greek philosophy and mythology to fathom biblical mysteries. You'll find in his ways of understanding the word, they called it the logos, that was the Greek word for it, that he draws upon Stoic principles, literally Greek theology, to try and explain the mystery of the Godhead. He was also the first to say that the word was not only distinct from the Father by name, but was also numerically distinct, but sort of. And I'm, I say sort of because Justin Martyr would, you had a Gnosticism at the time, and they believed in two gods, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. So Justin Martyr, he would say, no, 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 these are one God, but manifesting in different ways. They're two, but they're one. And the way he got around this was by saying there's two people, one substance. They're made of the same stuff, Elohim stuff, right? But they're two people. That's how he got around. the. To co- With that, he was able to say he was a monotheist, sort of, right? Yet he was happy to flip between monotheistic and binatarian ideology depending on who he debated with. So... You understand Trinitarian, before that came Binitarian, too. And dependent, so when he debated the Gnostics, he would go more monotheistic. But when he was debating with Jews, he would become Binitarian all of a sudden. So he kind of, like I said, the way he got around it was by saying they're both God's stuff, but two people. But they were, in his mind, they were equal. There, there wasn't this sort of. It was only while Yeshua was here on earth that there was this sort of Yeshua being lesser. But before that and after that, they're on, you know, that's how he understood it. So this is Justin Martyr's theology in a very basic diagram. There is Yah, Yah alone. And some point before the creation, the word comes along. And the word was thought of as Yah's mind or intelligence or wisdom. And basically the mind manifested at some point in time. Through these, they shared the spirit. This is the the God stuff, right? The same essence. They created the earth, the word, through the word and the spirit, and then the word and the spirit is what interacts with our creation. This is his ideology. Does that make sense? Hmm. But again, this is a, a slight... You can see where it starts to go a bit different. Justin Martyr is the first to really expand on Logos theology. So Logos is the Greek for the word, basically. And there was this whole thing of Logos theology, trying to understand the relationship between Yah, the Father, and the Son. Yeshua as pre-existent was thought of as the Father's mind and thought manifested in creation and revelation. So this is how they were one, yet they were kind of separate. Logos theologians' goals was to make plausible the twofold fact of Yeshua's pre-temporal oneness with the Father and his manifestation in space and time. So 
Justin Martyr actually believed that the Word and the Father were one at one point. They were one person, and then Yah, to create what we see, manifested his intelligence and his wisdom. And thus, it, and there was this kind of autonomy to the word. They did not hesitate to blend scriptures regarding the word of Yah with the stoic technical distinction between the imminent word and the word uttered or expressed. Okay, in stoic Greek philosophy, the, the, the idea of the Logos actually started around 4th century BC. And they used to debate this stuff. And about th th the 3rd century BC, the thought was that divinity, whatever divinity was, had the potential to speak, the potential to create. So the word was united with like, so let, let, let's bring it down to our sphere of existence. Um, when I stand here, I have the potential to speak. The word is imminent in me. Once I speak it, it becomes uttered or expressed. This was a Greek concept. And this is what Justin Martyr used to try and explain the Godhead. Whereas in monotheism, it was just Yah manifesting here on earth. Does that make sense? You can see, you might think, well, what's the point? You, you know Yah says line upon line, precept upon precept. You can't veer off a whole belief system just like that. You have to do it bit by bit by bit by bit. Thus the word became a separate entity from Yah. And this is the key. Before they were seen as one. One was a manifestation of the other. Now in Justin Martyr's thinking that they're made of the same stuff, but they're both separate. We, use, we see Greek theology being favoured over ancient Hebrew theology. This guy, by the way, was like, just, the, the church hails him. He was, he was initially a Greek philosopher. Like his Christian contemporaries, Justin had much disdain for Jews and anything. I mean, read his writings. He really hated the Jews. Really hated them. He thought the Jewish people were a cursed people. He was actually the first to teach that it was the Jews as opposed to the Romans that were responsible for Yeshua's death. That's where we get that from. He taught that the Sabbath, feast, circumcision, dietary laws had been fulfilled in Christ, therefore Christians were no longer to keep them, and to keep them was to fall from grace. This is where modern churchianity gets this ideology from, from this guy. Are you happy for him to define your Elohim now? This is where it really starts to go wrong. All the discussions in regarding to the nature of God that we have from here onwards are written by the church fathers. Every single thing. These men were men that taught lawlessness and derived their ideas of God from Greek philosophy and pagan thought. It is from here onwards that we see division and multiplicity within the Godhead. Before that, it was, it was monotheism all the way. At this stage... So about 150 to 180 AD, there were now seven, there were three main views on the Godhead. We had Logos theology, which is what Justin Martyr teaches. We've just covered this. Self-professed monotheists, yet happy to say that there were two gods at creation. Justin Martyr says that. There were two gods at creation, but they were both God. Interestingly... This is was mainly found only in the clergy and not the lay people. This is why I've put Logos theologians. This view was only prevalent in higher education, as it were. Modalism. This was another thing. It's also called modalistic uh, monarchianism. So monarchianism means that there is one in charge of everything. These were strict monotheists believing that the Father, Son, and Spirit are three modes of Elohim manifesting himself. These were opposed by Logos theologians. The modalists would call the, lo the, the Logos theologians uh, apostate or binatarian. They would accuse them of idolatry. This was actually the prevailing view at the time. It was the prevailing view. And this is their view, basically. You have Yah alone, who manifests himself through the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Now, we can, can we see the slight change from monotheism? They've made the Father another another manifestation as opposed to the father being on top these created the world and then the word and the spirit 
manifest themselves and work with creation. That's modalism. Can you see the slight difference though? What they've done, the father, who's supposed to be Yah, has now come down here. And they're all manifestations. Close, but quite, not quite. Another view was, now at this time, this became adoptionism. It's called dynamic monarchianism. These were strict monotheists that claim Elohim is one. And that the son was simply adopted. At his, so Yeshua was just a man. And he became God at either his baptism or resurrection or ascension. There was division even in that point. When did he become God, right? They claimed that Yeshua was just a man and was not pre-existent. So basically he earned his godhood by walking out perfectly. Now this was a reaction to the other two. So you had the other two views and this was the result. There was a reaction of it. This particular view was not around until mid-2nd century at the earliest. So all these people out there on internet land saying that Yeshua was just a man and never pre... He was a man, but he pre-existed is the word. To deny that, this view was... It's not new, is it? But it wasn't the original view. Okay, everyone with me? I know it's a lot of information, but I want to see you take you on the journey. So right now, where's my mouse? I've lost my mouse. We're around here now, in this area, about 160, 180 AD. Let's now look at Tertullian, this guy. Oh boy. This is another big heavy hitter in the church. Tertullian lived 155 AD to 220 AD. Now all his writings on the Godhead did not come around to 207 AD, so we're talking beginning of the third century. He was known, or is known, as the father of Western theology. His teachings were highly influential in regards to what would become the Trinity. In fact, he is the first to use the word Trinity. He used the word Trinitas. He referred to the Father and Son as two gods. He doesn't even mince his words. He said, yeah, they're two gods, but they're God. He is well known for his dialogue against Praxius, a modalist. So there's this big, you can read the debate. It's his version of it, by the way. So it's really interesting because you have a modalist who's a strict monotheist debating this guy, which actually tells us that his religion was not monotheistic by definition because he's debating a monotheist. He was actually branded a heretic due to becoming a Montanist and because of his views of Messiah. So about 200 AD, there was a guy called uh, Montanus, and he was the very first person to bring what you would call modern Pentecostalism into the church, this wild sort of shrieking and rolling around on the floor and speaking in heavenly languages. Montanus was a, used to be a priest of Kybele, Go see what they used to do in the worship of Kybele. Orgies, tearing of people apart like, while living. Like, it's disgusting. He used to be a priest of Kybele and then became a Christian. And people watching him being a Christian says, all you've done is take what you used to do and brought it into Christianity. He's accused of this. Tertullian became a Montanist, started following this guy. Which, again, he, Tertullian, by the way, is, one of, again, one of the big heavy hitters in regards to the Godhead. A, even, the, even the church at that time called him a heretic. This is what he says of the Father, Son, and Spirit. These three are one substance. And now, instead of it being two being of one substance, there's now three of one substance. Not one person. And it is said, I and my Father are one in respect, not of the singularity of number, but of the unity of substance. That's how they got around. So when people would accuse these guys, you're, you're worshipping more than one God, they're like, well, no, we're not. We're worshipping one God manifesting as three people, separate people. The problem is, is that in the monotheistic view, that they, they, it was the same person manifesting We'll cover this. 
I'm getting ahead of myself. There was a time when there was no son and no sin when God was neither father nor judge. So basically he says that Yeshua had a beginning. This is where this idea comes from. This is where it starts becoming and taking like momentum. He was one of the first to say that the son was created as opposed to brought forth. Please note the difference. We covered earlier that Justin Martyr said that the word and was basically the thought, the mind of Elohim. So, and that mind was brought forth and manifested. This guy's the first one to say the son was created, had a beginning. I said this in one of the earlier parts, but was it that the word had a beginning or that Elohim began to manifest and interact with creation? Tertullian is the first church father to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. First one. He explicitly defines the Trinity as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, he do, he, he, he's very shy about saying that the Spirit is actually its own person, except by saying that they're all three people. He admits, this is amazing, he admits that the majority of the believers in his day objected to his teachings. In his writings, when he's talking about his views, he fully admits that most people are shocked at his teaching. Have a guess why. Like I said, this is due to the majority of either being modalists or binatarians. This was like weird theology to them. And remember what I said about the Logos theology. This was mainly within the educated world. It wasn't on the lay people. And we see now this developing. In regards to his views on divinity, Tertullian came up with these ideas after he became a Montanist in 207 AD. All his stuff to do with divinity was after he started following this guy, who also brought this basically pagan idea of worship in the name of Yah. Are you now happy for him to define your Elohim? Tertullian's theology would eventually become Arianism. This is why he was actually uh, branded a heretic. Arianism is first attributed to Arius in this, uh, from 256 AD onwards. Arianism teaches that the son was created at some point in time and subordinate to the father. This is where that theology comes from. It wasn't around in the first century. What was around is that there was the Father and his word, and the word was the manifestation of, or the personification of his creative power. Can you see how things are slowly, you know, it's one bit at a time, one bit at a time. This is in stark contrast to this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. I'm not, look, Yeshua does say the Father is greater than I. Why? He was a human at the time, right? Let's now look at this guy, Oregon. Again, things start shifting a bit more. Oregon lived 185 AD to 254 AD, so now we're, we're hitting the third century. He draws a lot from Greek philosophy. I mean, <laughs> Everyone, even the church people, admit that, oh yeah, he's bringing all this Greek stuff in. If you go to a modern seminary, you will be taught Greek theology and Platonism and Stoicism to help you understand these things. He taught the eternal and pre-existent soul. This is where this idea, and guess where that came from? Greek philosophy. He is credited for making the spirit its own person. He fully outright says it. Instead of, like, he's just very bold with his words. The spirit is made a separate person within the Godhead using similar ideology as what is used to separate the word from Yah. It was the same. So, you, you, in the New Testament, we see these things of father and son, father and son. The, the father and his word. The word was an extension of Yah, as it were, but they separated them. As two separate people. And with that thinking, they then separated the spirit out. Because they saw, well, the spirit's doing this and doing that. It must be its own person. But we covered this in the spirit teaching, that it's the creative force of Yah. 
He believed that the father was superior to and created the son. So he, and then he takes it further and says that the son was superior to and created the spirit. So this is his theology. You have the father all alone in space or wherever, wherever and he creates the son. Then the son creates the spirit. Then all these three together create the world as we know it. And then the Son and the Spirit is what comes into our sphere of existence. We're, we're very close to Trinitarianism now, very close. But it's, it's subordinate in the sense that one is subordinate to the other. He states that the Father created the Son and that the Son created the Spirit. This is problematic in light of this passage. Therefore, Elohim gave them up to the uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to disrespect their bodies among themselves, who changed the truth of Elohim into falsehood and worshipped and served what was created rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Shaul says this because the creator was always thought of as uncreated, right? There is Yah. Yah created everything. Yah has no beginning, no end. If Elohim created everything by his word, that means his word was uncreated too. Remember what we said in the first century, the word was the manifested creative presence of Yah, his creative power, almost personified. To say that the word is created is to say that Yah had no word or wisdom before creation. There is, again, there's this difference between being brought forth and being created. I do not deny that the word was brought forth, but it wasn't created. There's a difference. Oregon also wrote this elsewhere. Up until the present, I have not been able to find no passage in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is a created being. Yet he taught it. His argument against polytheism was that three persons in the Godhead were three persons of one substance. So we can see how what happens, you have Yah, and then his word starts being separated from him. And then these become two people through one substance. And then the spirit gets added onto this later on down the line, and now you have three people, one substance. So this takes us to this. This is 250 AD here. The Roman Empire splits east and west. And then we have the old famous Constantine who brings the empire back together for a short period of time. And here is the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. So we're now at the beginning of the fourth century. Constant, so the empire has just been brought back together from the split. Constantine's main aim was to keep his empire united. That was all he cared about, keep the empire united. His primary motivation for sanctioning Christianity was because of that. He wanted to keep the empire united. Christianity had been outlawed at the time, by the way. And I've put here that Christianity had drifted a long way from what it used to be. However, Christianity was actually having a war within itself over the doctrine of divinity, which prevented the much-needed unity. This is the only reason this council was called into being. This is where the Council of Nicaea was called in 325 AD. Constantine was not even interested really in the doctrinal outcome. His thing was that there would be peace within the church because he understood that if, you, if the religion is united, there is peace in the empire. The primary issue was the Arian controversy. Arius taught that Yeshua was created at some point in time and subordinate to the Father. Opposing Arius' teachings was Athanasius, who taught an early form of Trinitarianism. What is missed by most is that both of these views were minority views within the Council of Bishops. Loads of bishops were invited. These views were minority views. Again, why? Because modalism and binitarianism was the kind of prevalent ideology. Constantine approved Athanasius' view, and, the pres and most present agreed against their convictions for fear of the emperor. Because if, if you didn't toe the line, out you go. Excommunication. No one wanted that. However, the Council of Nicaea did not end the debate. 
They, they, they said, this is the official view now of the Catholic Church, the universal church, but the debate didn't end. The bishops of various factions carried on teaching as before, and the Arian controversy went on for another 60 years after. Arius and his followers actually fought back. They regained imperial favour. So out with early Trinitarianism, now in with Arianism. Due to this, Athanasius was actually exiled five times. He would come back, go, come back. During this time, warring factions within Christianity fought bloody battles against one another. This is a quote. Probably more Christians were slaughtered by Christians in these two years than by all the persecutions of Christians by pagans in the history of Rome. Wow, what a thing to be proud of, eh? During this time, disagreement shifted towards the nature of the Holy Spirit. Because in the, in the Nicene Creed, they say, we believe in the Father and we believe in the Son, that there are two separate people of one essence, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit's kind of like, oh, well, it's there, and we don't know what to do with it. So, while, the, like we've seen, the debate was between Father and Son, and they thought that, okay, we, we fixed this problem, let's now move on to this problem. We always find something to bicker about, don't we? In the second half of the fourth century, the Cappadocian fathers, there's three of them, finally gave us what we now have as the doctrine of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal and what substance, yet three separate entities. And this is what that looks like. Can you see how things have shifted? Very slowly, over the centuries, we've gone from one to one and sort of two. Then we went from two to sort of three, and now we have three. This was officialized at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, end of the fourth century. Thus was born the Catholic Church. Anyone who didn't agree with this doctrine and with the power and authority of the church that enforced it was excommunicated, persecuted, and killed. And thus begins, you know, all Fox's Book of Martyr and stuff. Let's wrap this bit up. At the beginning of the first century, we have a monotheistic faith that believed that Yah manifested himself by his word and through his spirit. The earliest of believers saw Yeshua as Elohim in the flesh. Even the, uh, the very first church father said, you know, Christ Jesus is God in the flesh. As early as the mid-first century, the assembly is already falling into lawlessness and its leaders are becoming progressively more Greek and pagan in their theology. This is what happens when all the converts come in, right? They bring all their uh, theological baggage. By the end of the first century, we begin in seeing the seed sown for binatarian theology. It's been sown, it's kind of, you know, it's not quite there yet, but it's been going that way. In the mid-second century, we begin to see people separating Elohim from his word and making them two persons of one substance. Early third century, we see the son being created and clear outright binatarian theology, two beings of one essence. The shift is now not brought forth, it's created. Mid to late 3rd century, the Holy Spirit is made its own divine person. The Nicene Creed is formulated at the beginning of the 4th century. Late 4th century, the doctrine of the Trinity is made official. Three separate co-equal beings of one essence. That, like I said, it's a very reader's digest. You can take all these points and seriously, this is just, it's a lot to wade through. But you, you can start seeing the slight shift in thinking and that it happened ever so slowly. I hope that's been a blessing and at least it helps you understand kind of where these things come from and how they came about to be.